Hello, welcome to Call It Like I See It, presented by Disruption Now. I'm James Keyes, and today we take a closer look at some of the major world-shaking and world-sizzling events that have been unfolding this past week. Joining me today is the man whose voice is so soothing, he will make you believe everything will be okay. Tunde Ogunlana. Tunde, you gonna hit him with that bass this evening? Yes, sir. <laughs> <I am. laughs> all right, all right. Now we're recording this on January 4th, 2020. And over the past few days, we've seen some significant happenings all over the world. I want to jump right in. Tunde, let's start by talking about what's unfolding right now between the United States and Iran and the fallout following the U.S. taking out Iranian General Soleimani. Tunde, does taking out a leader or the leader of Iran's elite paramilitary forces make any sense to you? I would say yes from what I read about it um, in terms of the reasoning that was given. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it's, it's a pretty significant event. I think uh, last time, just a few weeks ago, that we had the conversation about uh, some comments on Iran. You know, I was the one kind of being uh, speculating why it is that we have not done a strike yet. After you know, they downed our drone. They attacked the British oil tanker in the, in, in the Gulf. They um, they attacked the Saudi oil fields. Um, and so this is in, I think that this strike that we saw a few days ago just is in line with um, a proper response between two countries that are having obviously an escalating spat, meaning United States and Iran. So yeah. that's why I don't, I don't think it was out of the normal, like it was out of the norm of the current environment we're in. And, um, you know, it obviously means something significant. I mean, this guy was very high up in the Iranian government and, and their military. So well, and that's, that's the thing that makes it uh, different, you know, in the sense that now he was high up in the Iranian official government, but he also played a lot of role or did a lot of things as far as under the table type of dealings, you yeah. know, the, the proxy type fights and, and also terrorist acts, you know, around uh, the Middle East. And so he's been someone that, the U.S. has had an eye on going back to the Bush administration. Yeah. Um, but Bush and Obama actually had opportunities to take him out and did not. And, you know, we'll get into to some of that thought process here shortly. But doing it right now, that's the part that, that stood out to me. Now, there's a claim that there were imminent attacks going. Now, that's something I think we oftentimes underestimate. There are war zones in the Middle East. So conceivably, there's always imminent attacks going, you know, that, that are there. And then we know the U.S. Embassy was just overrun a couple of days ago. Uh, do you connect any dots there? Or, or what do you see, and you know, from the timing particularly, like right now? In terms of what timing? Um, the timing, the like right now, January, you know, January 2020, you know, like, why is it happening now? Like I said, we've had this guy, as we've known this is a bad guy. There's, there's universal agreement. Yeah. Uh, that he's a bad guy and that he does bad things. So why now are we doing it? Do you yeah, take, I mean, you take I, the I, government? Look, this is why it's, it's tough to speculate because really this is none of us know. I mean, I don't yeah. even care what we're watching on the news. Clearly, correct, the, correct. The, the idea that intelligence agencies are there and that they exist means that we're not sure what the real details are. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to start with that and that I'm not trying to sit here acting like I know what's really going on behind the scenes. And, and I don't think anyone does, that unless, except for the people like the president and our top military people that, that, that are dealing with it behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, it's significant. I think, um, like we talked about on that previous show, we did discuss Iran um, in the last few weeks. Um, there's clearly a change to the direction of geopolitics. Mm -hmm. General, over this recent period of years um, in comparison with, let's say, the last 70 years, the post-World War II. And I think it, what I see over the last 20 years in the Middle East, I don't think anyone, you know, a finger shouldn't be pointed at anyone. And I think that as things are like rolling. So was it the right time, the timing to take this guy out now? I don't know, like I said, in terms of the real details. But what I would say is, Everything I've read, it seems like that it was a strategic strike that probably did make sense mm -hmm. because from what I was reading, Iran, through their proxies in countries like Iraq and Lebanon and Syria, has been causing a lot of you know, headaches for the United States and our yeah. military and what we're trying to do there. And from my understanding, there was a rocket attack on the Baghdad airport. Uh, on Thursday of last week, just a few days ago, and there was a lot of, you know, there were casualties, and they, they, they've just been a thorn in our side over there. And, you know, I guess the decision was made, you know what, maybe taking this guy out will send a message. 
that we're serious about this. So that's why to me, it's, it's, it, this is something that um, was probably just going to happen. And the other thing, which I find interesting, going back to this guy specifically, when you're talking about other administrations of trying to take him out, you know, there was a, they alluded to that. It's, uh, and I'll read from an article. It says, we've known every minute of every day where Soleimani is for years. There's no moment of any given day where five or six intelligence agencies can't tell you where he is. A Republican foreign policy hand said, it's been one of his talking points. The Americans can find me anytime. They just don't dare hit me. That told me a lot going back to the stuff we talk about, just human nature stuff. What happened with this guy too is he probably got too big for his bridges. You know, 10, 15 years ago, he was probably a young, younger guy coming up, doing the, the hard work, due diligence that every person does in their organization, right? And maybe in the last few years, because he wasn't touched by other administrations, he might have got a little bit, you know, grandiose and, and a little bit too big for his britches and starts talking, you know? Interesting, yeah. And that's what I started thinking, like, man, is, is, if what this guy is saying is true, which I don't doubt, which is the intelligence agencies just were on him constantly, maybe he started just talking smack over the phone to people too, like, hey, man, yeah, no one's going to touch me now. They're, you know, these guys, they're all listening and watching me, but they're too scared and... And maybe they're just yeah, you know, but that's not a reason. That's not a reason to touch him, though. And and now no, I'm, I'm not, not saying this. that alone. What I'm saying is, when you're looking at all the factors combined, you remember we don't know who he's. Like you said, he's not only in their official government and military. He's also directing Hamas. He's directing a lot of stuff that's behind the scenes. Correct. We don't know what he's saying to them. Intelligence services know what he's saying. So I'm just saying that maybe it got to the point where everything came to a head, and they're like, you know what? Dude, we need to we need to cut the head off this snake right now and show everybody we're still here. And we're well, no, I, mean, I mean, I'm with you as far as like with the lack of knowledge that we have standing where we stand. You know, we don't have the intelligence briefings and so forth. I'm not inclined to come out and, and call shenanigans, basically, and say that this was this was nonsense. This is you know, shouldn't have been done. Like, I'm, I don't think anybody's in a position to do that. But I do think questions should be asked, though, you know, in terms of timing. Uh, I mean, Donald Trump himself. Uh, rent on and on and on and coming up leading into Obama's uh, election year for re-election for his second term going on about how Obama's going to start a war with Iran in order to boost his election chances. There's that. There's a lot of things that it would be beneficial politically to distract the American public from that are coming up in the short term, whether it be impeachment or anything like that. Um, no, so well, let, let me let me let me finish the thought, though, yeah. because. The, the, the question should be asked, you know, like, well, why are we doing this now? Why? And, and that question isn't in the abstract. The question is also, well, why exactly didn't Bush do it when he when he could have? Why exactly did Obama do it? Why, what about their calculation that it wouldn't have been worth it? it is different now for Trump to decide that it would be worth it because Trump doesn't present himself in any way, shape or form as a measured decision maker. You know, so we, we, we do want to know, was this a measured decision? Was this saying, hey, screw, hey, I heard what this guy said about me on the phone. Let's just blow him up. Like, was this one of those? Because and, and then the other piece here, and this is where credibility matters. You know, credibility is one of those things that, that I, I think I've heard people say it's like insurance. You know, like you don't need it till you need it. But when you lie, people don't believe you when, when you say stuff. And so and, and, and honestly, you know, we live through the run up to the Iraq war where there's all this information out there that justifying a conflict that the leadership just wanted to go into. And all, come to find out, all of that stuff was, was just fabricated, or at least the, the, the key parts of it. And so here, immediately, you know, we're at, we had a story, imminent threats. You know? and, and, and again, I'm not one to say that that's incorrect or that that's false, but I am one to ask the question and, and just look at things sensibly and say, okay, they're better than them. And I'm not just going to, to sit back and never ask about it again. You know, we'll look at this and we'll continue. And, and I'm sure information will come out at a certain point. But I don't think anybody right now has, has, has built up the credibility where it's just like, oh, yeah, if that's what they said, that's definitely what it was. Yeah, I think you're right. Look, everything you said is, is spot on in terms of um, we need to always question everything when it comes to stuff like this at this important level. For you know, we could take it back to the Gulf of Tonkin, you know, there's WMD <laughs> with yellow cake. I mean, there's there's all kinds of examples of unfortunately governments lying to their people to start skirmishes in, in various parts of the world and various countries doing it. It's not just the United States that does it. Yeah, yeah, that's a power um, thing. 
And, and you're right. Credibility is very important. And we do have a president who is not credible in terms of telling the truth 100%. Um, or 50%. I, I, all or 30%. To stare, to stare at and figure out. I tend to think that what I've read of this particular thing, I feel like the president was less involved in this one. You know, obviously he was involved to give the final green light. And I thought about like the uh, Osama bin Laden, um, um, you know, assassination and, and all that, where I'm sure President Obama wasn't there every two seconds making, you know, while they're making decisions and training the guys and, you know, how are we going to, what, 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 uh, what munitions are we going to use? What, what air power are we going to use and all that? But at some point, somebody had a game plan and brought it to him and said, look, if we do this, this can happen positive and this might happen negative and we should probably do something now. What do you think? And the guy says, okay, let's do it. And I feel like the way I read it is this is probably similar to way to what happened with Trump, that some serious people, high level guys were that have been dealing with this for a long time. The generals, the you know, people in the State Department, all that, the CIA, NSA had credible information where this guy was. And based on all the other stuff that we talked about has been going on recently. Um, and, you know, someone brought it to the president's attention, I'm sure that, hey, we can do something now. Here's some pros. Here's some cons. And the president made a decision. Um, so all that's, all that's just the facts. And I think, you know, we're going to have to, or, or at least the facts as we know them, let me say it that way. And we're going to, I think time will play out. This just happened 48 hours ago from this recording. So I'm sure a lot more will play out, but to your point about, um, you know, Trump tweet in 2011 about Obama, maybe watch out that he's going to strike Iran. You know, I thought about that. I, I don't want to go there because I don't want to get back in the mud of the he said, she said, and all that finger pointing of BS of politics. All I'll say is this. Everybody, I think everybody at this point, after three years of this president, knows who he is. We know that he's, he's very um, um, expediently, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm sorry. Transactional. Right. Yeah. yeah. So when he's outside of the White House and he's not a politician and he's not the leader of the country, all he's going to do is talk crap about the person that's in there, whoever it is. Because it reminded me, like when I saw that in 2015, he was given speeches that the stock market was rigged. I remember that. Yeah. He said it's a joke. It's a hoax. It's rigged, folks. It's all inflated money. It's a joke. It's fake. Well, now that he's president and the stock market is doing great, he keeps talking about how great it makes him. It, it, it reflects how great he is. Then in, in 2016, during the election, Every time polls came out that showed him negative in the primaries against other um, Republicans, polls were fake. When, I, when he lost the Iowa caucus, people from Iowa were stupid. They weren't smart, remember? Um, oh, I mean, then, I, you can go all the way to the top, right, man. That's when what I'm saying. In 2016, so well, hold on. No, no, let, me, let me say this, because this, yeah. this makes your point. I, I'll still disagree. But you're make, like the best way to make that point is this is the guy who was planning to contest the election until he won. That's what like I was just going to say that, actually. <laughs> oh, that okay. in my notes, that he was already preparing to tell everybody the election was rigged, and then he won. So that so it was a mandate was at that point. The people spoke. Yeah, so my point is, and that's what I'm saying. That's why I don't want to focus on what he's saying about the Obama in 2011 and now, because I don't want to give him that much attention, honestly. He is what he is. Um, we all see what he is. And that's why it's sad. And this is where, to me, it becomes sad, all this stuff of where our country is in terms of this infighting of our politics and all this. Because the sad reality is, is that I'm not going to be like the people, the detractors of Obama when Obama was president. I'm not going to sit here and say that I want, you know, the president to fail and I want him to be a one term president because I hate him and all this. He's a president of the United States. I'm American. I live in this country. I want Donald Trump to be successful at his job as president of the United States. So when something serious like this happens, like an airstrike that takes out a high level guy from another country, that's an adversary. I want to give a, the benefit of the doubt that it's serious business going on behind the scenes, that this isn't just for an election and all that. Um, even though you're right, we got to ask the question and then B I'm going to give credit where credit's due in the right way. I don't like the Donald Trump administration. I'm not a fan of them and with the way they act and behave. I'm not mm -hmm. a fan of him and his behavior. I'm not a fan of his tweets. I think he's a narcissist, all this stuff. Like, again, we know who he is. Yeah. However, in this instance, I'm not going to just because I feel that way now act like 
this isn't something, if I'm looking at it from a strategic military standpoint, to me, it looks like it made sense. That's it. And Well, no, I mean, and that's, that's a good point. And I think that, well, yeah, I don't think from, you, I always like to say you don't want to, to not support what he's doing from a reaction standpoint. You don't want just when you, whatever he's doing, you're saying, oh, I don't like it. Yeah, like not, you should yeah. look at it, you know, when he, when he did the first step back, you know, people were upset about that. Like, oh, how could you, you know, how it, it must be BS if he did it or how could people work with him on that? And it's like, well, no, that's, that's something that, you know, is a good thing. So, you know, like, let's, let's be happy that it's done and, you know, like shake, shake the hand, if you shake the man's hand, if, 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 you, if you're in front of him, like, yeah, that's yeah. good. And, and so you don't want to just from a react, cause that's actually what you see happen. A lot, like you said, what happened to Obama, like no matter what he was doing, people were just saying they were against it. Right. But there is and a, and, that, and in the end, and that's why I say it's sad because in the end, at the end of the day, we all got to live in this country. Lincoln said it best, a house divided cannot stand, right? If you, yeah. you, need, you, need, you need a foundation and, and, and well, support walls. But, it, but so. it does, but there is something that doesn't mean that you turn a blind eye when, when it is a question of like, Osama bin Laden is not a fair or comparison because Bush didn't have plenty of opportunities to take out Osama bin Laden and then just after 9-11 and then just decided not to do it. Like, oh, well, we don't think that the calculation makes sense for us to do this. Um, Obama oh, was remember, the guy. There was that incident in Tora Bora, I think in 03 or 04, where the word is that they had him cornered in the mountains and then something happened and, and that fed a whole bunch of conspiracy But that's military, theories. though. That's that, military, though. Like that, no, that's but I'm not, just saying that... that but, but, but Soleimani, though, the, the, it's, it's established that it, like he even touts it. Hey, they know where I am at all times. They, they can get me anytime, but they know better. Like that, that was his... That's what he walked around saying. And it, so it wasn't a thing of, can we find the guy? Ob Osama bin Laden, they couldn't find the guy. Obama could find him. They had a small window where they knew where he was and they went in. And so the question of why now was because this was the only time we could. When the question why now comes up here for somebody that we could have taken out at any moment for the last decade, but we didn't. And the person who, who gave the order is on record touting the benefits of of using something like using not something like that, using that exact same thing in order to boost reelection chances, it, it, it you have to raise your eyebrow. You have well, to I wonder. This, I don't think. Well, I'll put it like this: I don't think you have to give anybody the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean you don't support. You want to support our troops. You want to support our military. You want to support our operations to try to move America forward. But at the same time, you should question the motivation of your leadership of the leadership and say, "Hey, is are, is everything on the up and up here?" Uh, and and, and you, you, as more information comes out, we're going to learn more, you know, and then that's really what it is. It's a wait and see. But I don't think well, you need to give the, the benefit of doubt during the wait and see. Yeah, well, look, here's the thing. I, I'm willing to give benefit of the doubt for this one just because it, it just appears to be what it was. I think the bigger question comes down to what the hell are we doing in the Middle East in general? And I don't mean that we shouldn't be there. I just mean it no, seems no, that no. that was my next question for you. And no. and and. We need to get a game plan, right? Well, let me, so, so that was my next question for you. Well, so, so but let me finish real quick on this one guy, because okay. what I was going to say is, I don't know much about this guy, Suleimani, right? We, mm -hmm. I didn't know who he was until 48 hours ago. So I've done some reading and all that. My, my point is, is that this is where I give everybody a break, seriously, because we have a different system in this country than a lot of other countries. Iran, for example, has a supreme leader who is above their president. Their supreme leader has been in that job now for 20 years, at least, if not longer. Um, I think he's the only guy that, that's been in it after the Ayatollah Khomeini, who did the, the thing in 1979. Yeah. So you figure yeah, in 40 the years, they've had two leaders so far. Russia, right? Putin's been 20, 23 years the president of that country. We're one of the few major world countries, because China's got the same president now, they're going to have him. And for been, the China has the same party. It's a single party. Yeah, correct. Rule, so my point is, is that what we have, which is good and bad, right? I think it has more good to it. But sometimes the negative part is our, our, our national strategy changes pretty quickly because we have we change leadership and government in a four to eight year period. So here's what but I it also changes sometimes by mandate of the people. So but go ahead. Go Correct. Ahead. But 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 just hear me out with just the, mm -hmm. the high level of the strategy of a country, not forget about the, the people part of it now. Yeah. I'm just talking about dealing with the Middle East. You got a guy like Putin in Russia. He's had a Middle East game plan, but it's his game plan for, for 20, 20 years. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. China's got a Middle East Africa game plan. They got the same game plan for a couple decades. 
we have game plans that change every time we have an election. Like you said, the people in this country can vote a new game plan in a sense, maybe not yeah. a total change. But so what I was going to say is if you look back over the last almost 20 years now, almost really yeah, 19 years between from the start of the Bush administration in 01 to today in 2020, I don't know where Soleimani was 20 years ago, meaning what level, I mean, he looked like in the pictures I saw, he's a guy in his fifties now, maybe. So maybe he was in his thirties. So maybe he wasn't that high up at the time. So maybe the Bush administration just didn't, he wasn't as much on the radar because he wasn't at the level that he is. No, he from what I've read, he's been a target for this since Bush was in office, like okay. not, not, not 20 years, but you know, since but, Bush, you know, like a, a high level target that whole time. And, and so, and then, because this is, again, for the audience, we're all speculating here because we're not, correct, I'm not the NSA and the CIA, so I don't really know what the hell's going on. But there's other things that I would say. The Bush administration obviously was focused primarily in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then we found out after Bush left office that they had one of the most destructive cyber attacks in the history of the world that they planned all through the Bush administration on Iran, and it was carried out in 09 by Obama after mm -hmm. he transitioned, but all the leading up. So my point is, is that clearly the Bush administration might have had this guy on their radar, but they already had their own game plan for how to deal with Iran. And it didn't include killing this guy, obviously. Then Obama had a different game plan. His game plan was, let me not start another war. Let's not do this with kinetic strikes and all that. Let's do this with diplomacy and let me try and win over the moderates within Iran by doing this deal that gets them off the sanctions and back to the world stage. So in order to do that without violence, obviously, he had to decide, OK, I can't take out their top guys right now because that's going to mess up my negotiations on the diplomatic side. So that's why I just think it's not that I'm agreeing or disagreeing with either of those administrations decision. What I'm saying is. We all got to just pause and look at, OK, what really happened over that last 20 years? Because maybe it wasn't in our interest to take this guy out where now maybe it is because this oh, administration certainly. has shown that they don't have the same attitude as the prior two when it comes to at least Iran and then maybe in a bigger picture of the region. No, certainly. I mean, it, it's certainly plausible that everything is on the up and up. I don't think you assume one way or the other is really what I'm saying. I don't think you give the benefit of the doubt that everything that the that this change in strategy was warranted and well thought out. Like, I don't think you give that benefit of the doubt. And I don't think you jump to the conclusion that it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, I think you you recognize the things that that look potentially a little fishy and you recognize how this could be, you know, a, a, a strategy that is designed to deliver us to a better place in the future. Um, and then we will see, you know, time will tell, um, but we don't predetermine necessarily what our mindset on this is going to be. Cause then you start missing stuff. When you predetermine things, you start missing, you know, things because that's how our minds work. When our minds work, once you decide something, your brain looks for evidence to back it up and disregards evidence that refutes it. it it's, it's a bias. It, it's a known yeah. bias, confirmation bias in our brains. All right. So I did want to ask you, and I mean, you alluded to this already. You, you, you jumped the gun on me or you, 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 you foresaw this coming. Uh, what should we be doing in the Middle East? You know, and, and you're, from your estimation, obviously, I understand you're not briefed from an intelligence standpoint on a daily basis as far as all of the, the, the real time threats and what's going on. But from a big picture standpoint, what should our objective be? Or what would, what would you uh, think that the right way to go about it? What should we want out of it and how should we get it? That's a good question. So my first answer is, I don't know. I'll be honest about that. And the reason I say it that way is uh, the Middle East has been just a powder keg for the last 50 to 60 years for sure. And definitely the last hundred years. Now, you're, um, you're more generous than I am. I was going to say a powder keg for the last 2,000 to 3,000 years. Well, but well, obviously, it's the cradle <laughs> of civilization. So, yes, yeah. where there's people, there's chaos. So three I agree three with different you. continents but, of people, three different. But I'm just know, talking kind of our just a modern world of, you know, I would say this. In the 17 and 1800s, they didn't seem to be making as much noise as they made in the 19, you know, 70s. Let's say. <laughs> that's all. And, and so um, you want that? You want the, the Ottomans back in charge? And, well, that's kind of was my <laughs> point is saying that again, going back to history, um, a lot of people don't realize that that whole region of the world, in its current form, is only about 100 years old. Um, yeah. The lines were drawn after World War One ended, which was in 1918, so literally 102 years ago. Um, and that's when countries like Turkey, 
Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, you know, Jordan, all were created. They didn't exist before. And so what you had were tribes that lived in those areas that then had lines drawn through their geographic regions. And now all we're seeing is people fighting over those lines. In a certain way, it's similar to what happened with the colonization of Africa. Yeah. And so the difference, though, is that there's not... Africa doesn't get the type of spotlight that the Middle East does because the largest commodity of the 20th century being oil, you know, was not under the earth of the African continent. It was the, under the earth in the Middle East. So that got a lot of attention. Now, my main thing, just to finish up this, this discussion, is all this conversation just leads me to say, uh, you know, in talking to our audience and Americans, our fellow citizens, this isn't about Trump, Obama, Bush, you know, no, yeah, I definitely, I want to go bigger than that. You know, like yeah, what, what a, a, you have a, a, a reasonable and, and deep, deeply, you know, contemplative mind. I want to know what, when you look at this, you know, what, is there a way to move to a better place than where we are right now? Well, I don't know. And that's what I'm saying. I'm posing a question to kind of the audience, meaning the American voter, which is what do we want our country doing in the Middle East? Like, why, what are we doing there? And why are we there? My so I'll give you my personal take, right? Of course, that's why. And, that's why you heard me say it. So <laughs> my thought would be, I'm I'm a fan more of the let's go stay there type of thing. Mm-hmm. I'm not one of these people that believes that somehow we can be the number one country in the world and be an isolationist. I just don't understand how that works because unless you you put China and India together, literally as countries, so that they have three billion people and the rest of the world has three to three and a half then they could be isolationists that one big country would have the world's population. But we have 300 million people and we got seven and a half billion people in the world. So I just don't understand how we think we can be isolationists with five, six percent of the world's population here and 90 plus percent outside of our country. So we got to deal with everybody. And the fact that we need resources from other parts of the world that aren't here. Yeah. So my point is, is that I think that the model, I think the model of the post World War II 20th century has been the best model, which is why we became the empire we became, which is you put a footprint long term in certain regions of the world. I'll say the two examples I have now are Germany and South Korea with our military bases. Mm-hmm. We have 50 to 100,000 troops and then by extension with their families and all that, about a quarter million Americans in each country, I believe, somewhere like that. What that does is that gives us eyes and ears and a presence in those regions, but it also does other things. The smaller countries that are democratic, that that, that aren't autocratic, that might otherwise be run over by a China or Russia, have some sort of protection and, and can operate. It helps with commerce and business. You know, the ability for us to sell products, goods and services in Asia and in Europe is not because they just love us and want to buy it. A lot of this stuff, you know, you got shipping routes. The U.S. Navy is in is in is, you know, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. All this stuff ties together. So my thing would be do re reinvent that model in the Middle East, in Iraq, where we've already taken that country over in a sense. Right. We did a regime change in 2003. We got Saddam Hussein out. We put a government in there. My goal would be, why don't we just keep the bases? We already got bases there. We got a green zone. All that infrastructure that we spent the trillions of dollars on is still there. Yeah. I don't see why we don't just move more people in there and just stay there. Well, I mean, and I would add, um, if, if you want to look, you can add Japan to that, too, in terms of post-World War II. Japan's a great example. Okinawa um, and the base there. And that's a great example. what we did in terms of rebuilding um, also engendered a lot of goodwill. Um, you know, like we, we went in and we rebuilt those things. We rebuilt them better than, you know, our own stuff. And, and that's very important. What you just said, the goodwill, you know, I think that's something that's been lost, um, over the last probably 20 years, but definitely with this administration, with the hollowing out of like agencies like the state department, which is our soft power. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like your one-on-one interactions as a human being, like with your family, my kids, if I just beat my kids all the time. It is a way to to kind of instill discipline. Yeah, maybe for a while that works. At some point, they start rebelling. And at some point, you know, that's where you get a kid that might kill their parent eventually, you know, kill me in my sleep. 
So a lot of, and parenting, right? A lot of the, 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 the control that we use is actually our soft power. Yeah. You know, I'm not sitting there beating my kid every day. I'm negotiating. I'm, I'm using certain fears and certain things. And, but it's all verbally and it's all through emotion and, and, and kind of the soft way that we as parents can manage a household, right? Yeah. And children. Yeah. And the way I mean, not only if the hammer is all, if the hammer is all you have, you know, like you, like to hammer everything looks like a nail. So you just end up swinging the hammer all the time, and And you need to have something else actually because that you can use. You can only use the hammer so much. But that's where I think we did a great job post World War II to up until you know the the new century. Let's call it until year two thousand. That let's call it at that time maybe fifty fifty five year period. Um, I think the United States had a kind of great. Um, you know, take out maybe the Vietnam War as an example of where we might have gone awry a bit. But we use the State Department effectively to bring down um, Russia in the Cold War. Yeah. A lot of that was done through, you know, the, the Eastern Bloc countries like Czechoslovakia, Hungary and all that, infiltrating those countries and, and, and kind of chipping away slowly at Soviet dominance in that region. Um, others were uh, examples like in Latin America, the CIA and others behind the scenes. And obviously, yeah. the CIA, I would call as a mix of soft and hard power. Yeah. But, and that wasn't as successful as when we just, as you pointed out, just just go in up front and, and just be a presence, you know, a huge presence, be a part of right. the solution of of everyday life. You and know, think, in terms and, of making and, life. And, and I also think it's cheaper in the long run. Like, I don't know what it costs to have the bases in, in, in Japan, um, 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 Germany, and, um, and, and South Korea. I'm sure it's not cheap. I'm sure yeah. it's hundreds of billions a year or billions a year, or whatever, tens of billions. But I'm just wondering, okay, let's say we really got into a hot war with Iran. Like, for real. That ain't going to be cheap. And it's going to be messy, and it's going to disrupt a lot of global stuff. And I'm just wondering, like, if we had a base, just not, you don't need 50 to 100,000 in Iraq. Let's just say we had a base fully operational with 25,000 troops ready to go at a given's notice. You had the F-16s, F-18s, the Apaches, all that. You had a nice fleet of of planes and and helicopters. Iran would be put in a box with just that. That's it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really interesting thought. um, But I think it comes back to what you said. You know, Americans have to decide what they want. Um, some of that is poor leadership. You know, our, when when leadership doesn't have a, a a coherent and sensical plan, you know, then it's hard to get people on board with such large projects because that would be a large project. But nobody seems to want to do, and so everybody or know what they want to do, and so everybody's just like throw your hands up. Let's just do nothing, or let's just do the the minimum possible. But that clearly isn't the best way to get an optimal result. Well, and and this also not and, I, and uh, we're going to cut this. I know maybe this might be for another show, but I think this comes back to leadership and who's in charge and what they know in terms of their own life experience when it comes to this stuff. And that's where I feel like we have. A, a president now who has very, very limited government and foreign policy experience in general. Um, the former president, I would say, probably had a personal uh, experience that was geographic and, and multinational and all that. But obviously, his experience in government was was more limited as well. The prior president... And foreign policy. You yeah, know, and like foreign being policy able to, was limited. Yeah. Prior president, same thing, even though he was the son of a prior president. I would say well, W, obviously, if you had go a lot back more with, inside that. But if you look at W, that was president. If you look but at to w, me, w, one of the well, greatest on, presidents on. in foreign policy history in our lifetimes, at least, was H.W. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought about yeah. it, though, but think about it. How important has, was probably his experience in the CIA, being CIA director, being ambassador to the UN, and then vice president of the United States for eight years? So when he got into the job, he had already built relationships globally with other world leaders. That's and he also, important. he was in the military before, right? Also, I mean, so. Yeah, I mean, that was World War II, but yeah. But even still, it, it does create a, a, a humility there um, where you're just not a cowboy. And I don't think you can mention W. Bush without mentioning the fact, like a lot of shadow policy was made in that administration. That Correct. was really Dick Cheney's vision. So, but I, I think your point is well made though. You know, we will move off of this, but uh, I would say, if, if Americans decide that they do want to continue to be the, the, the world's empire, 
then those are the type of things that people do, that, that we do need to do. Um, if we're just going to pull back and, and look inside, which there is reason to do that in terms of allowing our, our, our own country to fall apart um, from a social cultural standpoint, but then also just from a like nuts and bolts infrastructure standpoint, um, all of those things need to happen. But the, the reason that stuff isn't happening isn't because we're spending all the money somewhere there or somewhere here. That's because people are too busy fighting over stuff that's really distractions. You know, like people are so busy fighting among each other over things that they can't get to work on constructive things and constructive things to build the country, constructive projects to build the country up on the inside and on the outside. No, I agree. And it goes back to like we said about the, um, um, you know, what between this president and the prior president and probably, you know, started under really Clinton. Um, but since Clinton, the, the, the uh, people that opposed that sitting president all they want to do is find a reason why everything that president is doing is bad and to bring him down. And I think that has gotten in the way over the last 30 years or so of our ability as a nation to really move forward in a lot of areas, because what we're just talked about is an important conversation. And if we had a government that was functional, and I don't mean that every government should have political debates and arguments internally. But this is where both Democrats and Republicans as leaders, not I'm talking about people in the national committees and the people voters, I'm talking about the senators and Congress people and the leadership should have a united message like you're saying, hey, if we're gonna be the most dominant country in the world, we need to have footprints globally. And here's how it's gonna be done and at least agree on that. Yeah. And um, the fact that we don't is a reason why every other country's kicking our ass on their infrastructure, on their IT, on all that, because they've made decisions that they want to move forward in those areas. But we're still arguing about, you know, how our elections work. And if yeah. NFL players are taking a knee during the anthem, and if, you know, like just, that's the stuff that it takes our attention up as a country. And no yeah. wonder why that we wake up and Russia's running circles around us when it comes to spending, what, a couple million bucks to disrupt their whole election through cyber <laughs> intrusion. Because we're sitting here arguing about the dumbest stuff ever. So yeah, I mean, well, and, and Russia's looking at the stuff we're arguing about and using that stuff too in, to, to and, mess our election up. So I mean, it's it's definitely um, you know it, it's one of those things. Like in a democracy, you always have to look to the people. You know, like it's not there. We can't blame some king, but the leadership is all has also been poor, and so you wonder. And when I say that, I mean. For a period of time, I'm not talking about. Yeah, that's, what I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's been about 30 years of this type of just. It wasn't as dysfunctional 30 years ago, but it, it's definitely led down that road. Well, it's been that. It's been that track, and you know, it's just been one of those things where there's problems, and so the only thing leadership wants to do is find somebody to blame. You know, yeah. it, it's not, or they just it, their way is the only way to solve the problem. So they, that's the only way they're going to agree to do it, and and so it's just, and that's not how you. you, you have success in life, you know, in any, you know, if you're running a business or if you're doing anything like that, like it's just not, you know, if you're part of an organization, any organization, you know, you, you have to work with people, you know, these are social constructs, you know, they, it, it, by definition, you got to work with people. So, you know, Americans have to be willing to work with each other, you know, set out a common vision and we, it, and choose leadership that reflects those type of values and that type of an approach. So, you know, it, it, with that, um, I think we're going to wrap this episode. Please check part two, which we're going to release in two days. In part two, we're going to discuss the uh, the fires in Australia, and we're going to discuss the, the split of the United Methodist Church. And also, we wanted to touch on some interesting things we've seen in the past few days on intermittent fasting and so an app that is getting accused of body shame. So with all of that, you know, it's definitely an interesting conversation. So please check us out. So until next time, I'm James Keys. I'm Tunde Ogunla. All right, thank you. Subscribe, rate, review. We'll see you next time.